This chair was woven by a first-time student. This is an intermediate chair seat, but you can do it. Our chair caning classes in the shop are five days long, and I'm gonna try to make this video about an hour. You're not gonna understand everything. Even if you did take one of our in-person classes, you still wouldn't have a comprehensive education of chair caning after a week. It takes weaving many, many chairs in many styles, many shapes, many construction elements before you really start to understand the process. So be patient with yourself. Realize you will understand the technique the more you weave chairs. The basic pattern is the same on any shape chair. It's a six way pattern or a seven step method. Two verticals, two horizontals, and two directions of diagonals. The seventh step is this binder that goes around the perimeter of the chair seat. To use landmarks on the chair to determine what the center is. These round chairs have a joint and just count in. Now I'm gonna use the same method, finding the seams and counting in. These centers look pretty good to me. starting at the center and working our way out to each side. That the shiny side is up. I'm not gonna tug it too tightly, holding the tension below, peg it on top. Find the hole next to the one you just came down. You don't get any twists underneath the chair. Feel that this is the smooth side and this is the raw side. Just put your finger there and you can feel the smooth side. Rotate the cane around and bring it to meet its neighbor on the top. I'm not really pulling tight on it. I'm just holding the tension and move the peg over. Keep the top side on top. Instead of pulling the tension down the bottom, I'm going to pull the tension toward the back and then hold the tension. Move the peg come up to the hole next to the second row in the back. I'm guiding it underneath to make sure that it doesn't twist. You're not ever weaving under the chair seat. It's very intentional when you bring the cane all the way up to make sure it doesn't get twisted. Pull the tension on the top, hold the tension on the bottom. Hold the tension on the top, hold the tension on the bottom. It's got a lot of flex. We're not going for maximum tension. This part is tricky. That's why I leave it until later and come back to it. So now I'm gonna go back to the center and work my way out to the side. Just because I have this long strand of cane here doesn't mean I can't use it. I almost never cut off long strands of cane because you can use them in a different step. You can rough the pattern in, it seems to go a little quicker. The trick is you gotta make sure these loops underneath stay untwisted. I'm not pulling tension from below, just pulling it the rest of the way down. Pull just the tiniest bit of tension on the top, feeling underneath to make sure that loop doesn't twist. Tension forward, not down. Step one is mostly done. Done enough for me for now. I'm gonna look down and see that everything looks kind of even in the spacing. None of these loops got twisted. We've got some tails we're gonna have to tie off eventually, but I'm gonna wait until a little more material gets on the bottom. I like to start at the front and work my way back. Use the landmarks on the chair. So we have a seam here seam here that's usually about right i'm gonna look at it head on and make sure i have this really long strand that i didn't cut off previously so this was a step one strand that came to the next hole and is now a step two strand 
there's one hole and then where the peg is and where I'm going to put this first horizontal. The cane is always going to want to get stuck on something, whether it's a tail or a chair leg. Keep checking underneath that the smooth side is up and untwisted. <laughs> it's the first time it's happened. When it comes up, you can see it wants to go this way. Well, I want it to go this way. If I just bring it over, it has a tendency to crowd this hole and bring it against the edge the way it wants to go and swoop it around. Step three is going to make a pair with the vertical that's already there in step one. Talking, I'm just going to go to the right. There's a nice little space for it to lay in. It's going to go right on top of step two and we're going to continue across the chair. You want to make sure it's not right on top of step one. Shift it over with a fingernail. So you want it to be next to step one. Move that over, place that there, shift it over. And now it's nice and next door to its pair. One and three are neighbors. They don't live right on top of each other. They live comfortably next to each other. Mm -hmm. Here's a trick to sort out uneven spacing. So this piece is loose and move it to the hole next door. It still looks a little weird, but what if I did this? And that's what you're going for. Nice, even spacing. Nice and even for, until you get to these side pieces. Both of these are tails, so that's great. I can just move these two strands over. You don't want to bend it back on itself, so I always put my finger here to support that. It was here. Now I'm going to move it one hole over. And underneath, step two. Now I've made space. Now I can bring step three strand, just like that. but you can just move it over. It looks like we could fit another horizontal strand in here. We like to add dummy strands. This one looks pretty good, but what if I did this? By moving the top strand up, it creates a lot more even space, and I really don't think we need to add an extra strand. So it looks like we can fit two, but let's go ahead and make space. We bring that down. We'll have room for maybe just one more pair. Step two goes between steps one and three. It's not very hard to thread it through. Just pull down on the bottom, or you can use a caning needle if you have one. Before I put anything firmly into place, I like to shift it down and see what happens with the grid. Chair caning is nothing if not making tons of judgment calls as you go. I like to keep one horizontal pair at the edge. So if I scoot this down and then these come down, we might only need to add one more strand. This still looks like a lot of space, but trust me, when we weave step four in, we'll be grateful to have that room. This still looks pretty close. This is looking a little better. Step one goes underneath step two and thread it under. Bring step three up, move it to the side. Step three is on top. 
I'm going to split the pair and scoot this over. Good even spacing here to here and all the way across. That's too close. That's still pretty close, but I think that will work. That's too far apart. Back to here. And remember, step one is on the bottom. Shift that over it's right along the edge of the wood. I've coiled up the long strands that I'm going to use later, and I'm going to tie off some of these shorter strands. Wet the strands and the loops before you start to tie them off. But the most important rule is not to crowd the holes. All of these different angles help to get underneath the loops. If it's too thick, it could break the loops. You don't want to pry it up. You want to just make space. Time the raw side is up. Remove the pick and tug. You can see it kind of shifting in the hole here. So I like to make sure that the cane is all the way at the edge and roll it over. That way you have lots of space to come up for your next steps. There's not much space to loop under, but I'm gonna give it a shot. That one worked. And that is pretty tight. Make a point, push the cane through at the same time as you remove the pick and come down. There's plenty of space here. The tail faces in towards the seat and these face out. I really don't care which way they go so long as this hole is nice and open. I decided it was too risky to try to pry both of these up. You can see little bits of wood started to chip away when I barely even scratched it. So I just went for one loop and I'm gonna secure that way. The rest of these are pretty long and we'll be able to use them for step four, five, and six. And now for the fun part, or don't need this one, don't need that. I decided I'm gonna weave below step two. I can make a lot more space by just scooting that up and scooting it down later. They either go underneath step two or on top of. It really doesn't matter as long as you stick to it the whole way up the seat. If you pay attention here, it's called a setting. So step four is going to go the opposite of step two. I like to pull the entire strand of cane under the first setting before weaving anymore. Remember to make sure that the cane is not going to crowd the hole. Rotate it around, secure it with a peg. Use your finger so that the cane doesn't back up on itself and crack. And shiny side up. And you can see that a long strand is pretty unwieldy, but it's better than having too many tails. Over the right strand and under the left. Here, especially, it's going to want to twist. I always have my finger either in this loop or holding it right here to make sure that it doesn't twist. Give it a slight tug. It takes constant vigilance to keep the cane from twisting. It's pretty tricky when the setting is completely on top of the wood, but it's helpful to come at it from this direction. So you're pushing the right side down and lifting the left side up. The reason for split pairs is evident right here. 
If this step four went into the same hole as step two, it would go over top of this strand, underneath this tiny strand. And you risk breaking it, mangling the cane. Just drop it in here. We're going to move step two to meet it. Step four does a lot of work. It weaves over and under. It's going to dry out quickly. So I use a little bit shorter strand, uh, maybe about half of, of a really long length. Remember that you're going beneath step two and not on top of step two. I'm going to do the opposite that step two did. Step two went over the left, under the right. I'm going to go under the left and over the right. Give the cane a little curl. That helps it ideally slide right under. It's always gonna wanna twist on you, so keep your hand ready to keep that from happening. I like to keep this loop up top. It's just much easier to manage. And you can see twists happen and fix them before they get into the pattern. The working end always gets a little raggedy. So you want to leave a little bit of extra to make sure you have enough to tie off. This one, haha, there it goes. Already uh, getting raggedy enough to break. A little bit more through if you need to and if your cane just keeps breaking just get rid of that strand it's just gonna keep breaking on you and causing more trouble if this loop is underneath the chair it's gonna twist and now I'm over at the settings for this guy sitting directly on the wood with step two trapping it down, I'll need a pick. Prying this one up and that pushing this one down. And then bring the two and four strands together. So here there's a big space easily solved just by shifting things down. Step two and step four come together. And as I fill in, I'll keep shifting these down so you have a nice even grid. A little bit of dampness from the top and the bottom. If you just kind of grab and it gets tangled and you start weaving, you could weave a twist into your pattern. You'll have to take it out. So how you avoid that is take your rag, squeeze at the anchor point here, and then just back it up. Pry one side up, the other side down. Give your cane end a little curl. I like to do just the one setting first. Watch this, it's always gonna wanna do that. It's kind of a flipping motion, flip it down. Bring that loop all the way down, flipping it underneath, bring it all the way up, flip it all the way down, all the way up. Three or four intersections. We like to call this the inchworm. Your strand is loose, but on top of the pattern and your working end is the inchworm. I'm going to do one more because I'm feeling confident. Bring step two to meet step four. This peg is holding tension here in a lot of places. I still needed to hold the tension, but it's gonna get in the way. So I'm gonna peg it from below. 
back the cane up. Now this is tricky. You don't want to come around behind your cane ever. So I'm coming at it this way, that's fine, or on top of it and this way, it's fine. But you don't want to cross behind your cane or this way because it will twist. I did some organizing at the bottom. As I kept weaving up the chair, I didn't organize as I wove. So these few rows are a little bit crunchier. This chair has been mostly organized. You kind of look down the chair and see if you can get some of these vertical pairs aligned. The first vertical pairs on each side, right at the edge of the wood. This one's a little straighter. And then move to the center. They make tools for these if you do a lot of chair caning. Find one of those tools because they save your hands. This works just as well if you don't have all those tools. Now I've come to the part where we split the pairs. Here's your step two, here's your vertical pair. In step four, go under the left, over the right. This piece is still the right, even though it's by itself. So we're gonna do over, just easy peasy this time. Here this hip brace is getting in the way. So I'm just using my finger to pull it a half inch at a time. I'm also going to move this up. Nice, it's not holding any tension. And because this is going to be a deep bend, I'm going to wet the setting and wet right at the bend. Here is step two. Step four goes under the left, over the right. Here's your vertical pair. It's a single. This step two goes on top. And we always do the opposite of step two. So we're just going to pop this under. Here it is. Follow it a couple of snips. Make sure you're cutting the right one. Unweave a couple of intersections so you can have something to hold on to. And if you forget which one you removed, if it was left or right, just check with your neighbors. Your neighbor is always going to be the opposite. These two guys are exactly the same. So this one needs to go in between these two. Bring enough to get across and you just weave it in just like you've been doing for step four. Over and under three or four intersections at a time. Now remember, you don't want the pairs to do the exact same thing as each other. So when I came up, I am doing the same thing as the pair and it's not following the rule of opposites. So I'm gonna bring this guy back down. All of the ones on the left are underneath step two. Going to go back where it came from. When you get to the back of the seat, you're gonna come up.
that was a lot of work. You probably won't get that far in a day. Usually I get to about halfway through and take a break for the day. The grid needs some work. It's tight in the middle, a little more open here. So I'll space some of this back. Remember how much space we had at the front and I didn't add an extra row. It all fills in really nicely. The six way pattern, our diagonals side by side in one direction, our diagonals side by side in one direction. This can be step five, this can be step six, or this can be step five and this can be step six. It doesn't matter, just pick a spot and start weaving. Think of your round chair seat like a clock face, 12, three, six, and nine. The back of the seat is 12, three, six, and nine. From 12 to six, the verticals line up nicely. And then from nine to three, the horizontals line up nicely. I think of it as a cross and corners. A cross and corners. The vertical settings are these longer pairs that go directly into the hole. Here it's relatively easy to go from hole to hole with your diagonal strands. It's the corners that are tricky. Here are the horizontal settings, the pairs that go directly into the wood. It's the corners that are tricky. Sometimes two consecutive diagonals will meet in the same hole. You consider horizontals and verticals as one unit now. On this particular chair, this direction of diagonals will always go over top of horizontals and underneath verticals. You want the diagonal to glide through these little pockets. In the completed pattern, where you have two directions of diagonals, one strand goes underneath and the other strand from the other direction goes over top of the pair. It doesn't matter if it's vertical or horizontal. On the horizontals, you have one strand going on top, one strand going underneath. Notice on the horizontal settings that this strand goes over top. Because of the rule of opposite, the strand going in the opposite direction goes underneath the horizontal settings. Where both diagonals have already been woven, Notice that one of them is short and one of them is long, and they consistently follow the same pattern with all diagonals in this direction going under the sky and all diagonals in this direction going over the sky. You can start anywhere, and it's fun because now you get to use up all these dangly things that have been getting in your way the whole time wrap one of these coils in a rag. This step doesn't need to be as damp. It works better a little more dry. Because this has been sitting, you want to wet the anchor point here at the base of the chair. How do you choose which way to go? If you don't have a loop somewhere, I would make one. This gives you opportunities to tie off. I'm going to bring up here I'm going over and under in a stair step, but I did it incorrectly. Notice that it's kind of snaky and it's not wanting to pull. So don't glide any diagonal that doesn't want to glide. Remember I talked about the pockets? You want the cane to glide nicely through these pockets. Well, for me to do that, I'm going to have to go over verticals instead of under them. Over the verticals so that it would slide nicely in this pocket. I'm going to go under horizontals, rule of opposites. It glides through this pocket. Flip it down all the way, bring it up all the way, give it a pull. It glides nicely in those pockets. You're going over verticals and under horizontals. You never will go over a vertical and a horizontal at the same time. Notice it's kind of a stair step. So think about going over and up this hole to make the stair step happen, over and down. Sometimes it helps not to think about the pairs so much as the spaces. So down here, up here, down here, 
up here. It's gliding nicely, so I know that it's going correctly. Back it up and continue down the stairs, over the verticals, under the horizontals. You're not over the verticals until you're all the way down. And you're not under the horizontals until you come back up. Over the vertical, under the horizontal. Try to keep the cane out of your way. Have fun with that, it's not easy. But try for it to not be floating this way. Keep it away from you so you can drag it toward you. Over the verticals, under the horizontal. Over the vertical, under the horizontal. Try to weave several intersections and then pull, keeping this main loop on top and working with the working end as an inchworm. Use a pick to help get you under the weavers that are on the wood. Don't assume that the cane strand now goes in the hole closest to it. It's a common mistake to do this and it can throw you off. The reason why is that you go over and under every single pair. If I went into this hole, I would be ignoring this setting completely. Over verticals, under horizontals, over verticals. You wanna cover up this space of wood and make sure that each pair has a diagonal on top of and underneath it. The underneath one will come with the other step going this way. We're gonna come up next door Bring the cane around and make sure you don't block this hole. Over verticals and under horizontals. Lock it into place. If it swivels out, lock it back into place. One thing that I see a lot of people do is to leave this loose. And then when you go to pull it, it gets super twisty. All the way down. The glide is good, so I didn't make a mistake. But it is kind of hard to pull away from me. So I'm going to rotate the chair and pull it toward me. that if you get lost, just find your neighbor and follow the pattern. Every once in a while, dampen the anchor point and dampen the strand. Now you've come to the end of this row and you have another decision to make. Here, here, here. Well, that just looks wonky. Am I completing the pattern? Am I going under and over every setting that I can? If I went in here, I would be skipping this setting completely. So I need to make space and go under it. You're going up here. You'll never take a deep dive. Now this one meets up with this one, two diagonals meeting in the same hole. That's what happens in the corners, is a cross, and the corners are where it gets tricky. You'll often have two diagonals meeting in the same hole, just like up here. Two diagonals meet in the same hole. Make sure you protect this. So I could either get another strand or I have this conveniently located long strand from before. This vertical that I left long, bring it up to the next hole. Swoop it around and I'm ready to continue moving down the chair. It's just gonna keep breaking. I also noticed 
this guy was breaking. So I'll back this up and leave enough to do a tie off. For this strand, I'm gonna cut it. Follow it along, cut in several spots along the way. Make sure you have the right one. I didn't cut it way back here, leave enough to tie off. Instead of unweaving this whole row, follow the line, give it a snip. Follow the line, give it a snip. Now I just have to weave one in here. I'm gonna go over first and then under, over first and then under. This one was my example. It went over top and down, up and down. I got this row woven in. The long end came to the next hole and now I can continue with diagonals. I have woven hundreds of this same chair. I made a mistake. I started weaving this way and I realized it's not hitting a pocket. So I look next door and I say, hey, but that's underneath. So this is underneath. And then I looked back further. It's actually this diagonal goes on top of these. What did I do wrong? Here it is. Over a vertical and a horizontal. Pull that out. Bring this out. Over vertical, under horizontal, over vertical. You don't wanna just leave that vertical empty. You're going under horizontals. Probably a good idea to wet it so it doesn't snap. Had trouble going through, so I'm gonna give it a point. And now it just pops in right here. This diagonal went here. This diagonal went over here. So there's a skipped hole. It's hard to explain every little tricky part you will encounter because there are so many of them. Where do I go next? I'll bring it here. Just This tiny row is a thing. We're gonna ignore it right now. You don't have to weave straight up the chair. It might drive you crazy not to do that, but I like to use these coils. There was a coil on this side. I wove step five towards the back of the chair seat and went right in the hole. Sometimes it is as simple as just dropping it in. When I came down, I came up next door. So you might notice that I skipped a row. Had I gone here, you don't want the cane to look like that. It should never be exactly parallel to and right up against a vertical or horizontal pair. With this process, sometimes you'll have to skip holes and sometimes you'll have to skip rows. And this is a hour long video, so we can't explain everything in detail. Just keep weaving chairs, skipping a row. So now where does it go? Because you never cross two horizontal pairs at the same time or two vertical pairs at the same time. This guy was a long dangling strand that I had coiled up, so I wet it and I can bring it up here to finish this missed row. Now where? Straight in, crank it around this way. Anytime you go parallel with a vertical or a horizontal pair, that's incorrect. Even though we have two strands meeting in the same hole, this piece came down here and I brought the cane up here. I can finish filling in. Keep your finger there just so the cane doesn't bend and break. I'm on this row and I'm at a split pair. In this case, you just go under one of them.
Where do I go? So straight in or next door. Following this pattern, under, over, under, over. Can I get over this and into here? Will I be going over and under every single setting that I can? Lock it in place. Here's where it is really easy to screw up. If you were to keep going from hole to hole, it would throw your pattern off all the way up to here. This row goes under and over horizontal and vertical settings. If I went in here, I would be missing this bit completely. I would also be leaving a big chunk of wood showing here and missing out on the opportunity to strap this piece down so it doesn't shift. Corners are tricky. You will often have two diagonals meeting in the same hole. Hour long video, we can't explain it all in detail. Mostly it just takes practice. Here's another place you can get trapped. If you wanted to go hole to hole, you would be going over and under two consecutive horizontals and you never do that. It's always vertical, horizontal, vertical, horizontal, vertical. So these two strands would meet here. This one just goes under this pair and down. No need to mess with this. It just goes straight down. I'm going to weave down and back the tricky part. Another trap. If you go hole to hole, you'll be skipping this pair. You'll be leaving this chunk of wood exposed. If you can go over or under it, you should. So this last row here will meet up with this neighbor in this hole, completing the pattern, covering the wood. I wove in these dummy strands so you could see what the beginning of a V would look like. And if I had continued, I would have thrown myself off all the way around the back edge. I need to get up under these and go into here. It kind of blocks the tunnel where this cane has to travel. You bring it around behind and push up onto the wood, and then you have more space for your cane to go through. If you drag it this way, you might cut this strand here. So drag it like this, flip it into position at the last minute. I'm going under these short bits here, right side up, shiny side up, in a circuit around here. I'm bringing the cane about six inches under, and with the shiny side up again, I'm gonna come around here to create this U. A couple of intersections away from the setting, pull both strands at the same time, and pop it. If you had the shiny side on the outside, it might flip the cane. It's especially important right here to draw the cane in line with the pair. Make sure you're not crowding the hole. Last minute, pop it in place. Replace your peg so that it pushes this cane against the inside of the hole. This row will just go right here, skipping a hole from this row. It's just too small to try to work the cane under there. This one is tricky, of course it is. It could drop right in, but we could also scoot these back and work it under using that circuit method. It does leave this big chunk of wood showing but there'll be something that'll cover that up. I'm gonna leave this last row, do all these four corners at the same time. So now it's time for step six. This piece went down here, came up here. Remember it from earlier, it was gonna have to take that deep swoop to come back around. There's plenty of it to come all the way across and have some length to tie off. So I'm gonna start step six here. It's great to use up all these 
dangling bits. You're going to be so grateful for them later on when you're only tying off a few knots. Wet the strand. And let's talk step six diagonal theory. You'll never have step six and step five doing the exact same thing. If one is going over, you are going to have to go under. It locks into that groove, and I can continue going under verticals, over horizontals, under verticals. Same rules apply, working in the long loop in the back on top, all the way down, all the way up, all the way down, all the way up, doing the opposite of the last step. This one went over, we're going under. This one went under, we're going over. Do several intersections. This is pretty tight. I might do less next time. Now we're in the corner. It's not going to do that. It's not going to go under and over all of this. So it's just straight in. I only had enough room to get to the back. I have these three conveniently located strands I can bring up here and start weaving. This means less tie-offs later. This chair is a twin to one that is part of that set that we're shooting. This one, I wove steps one through four. I didn't cut any lengths off and look how much I got done just using the long ends. By using the long ends of steps one through four, you're able to create a lot of loops underneath and you will have less tie offs. I was able to get this much of one diagonal plus a little here and here and several of the other directions of diagonals in just by using those long strands. So wet right at the bottom here. Give the coil a squeeze. I'm gonna peg below so you guys can see. We could go this way and that would be correct. We'd be skipping a row. We could also go this way and it would be correct. Let's do this way. Step five went under, you're going over. Step five went over, you're going under. Hitting the pockets all the way down, all the way up and glide. Two diagonals meet in the same hole. Just coming down, I can come up here or here. If I came up here, I'd work this way. If I came up here, I'd go that way. This guy goes right in, not back here, not crossing all of this. As this distance gets smaller and smaller and smaller, that's where the trap is going to happen. This piece has something going over it. It should have something coming under it as well. That piece would have to come from this hole, but I just went down there. So I came up here. I'm going to have to skip a row. I'm going to take this piece under and up. I'm going to use that trick where I bring the pick behind and make space. Drag it in line with the pair. At the last minute, pop the peg, use your hand to support it, and lock it into place. If that made sense to you, you are a chair caning prodigy. It really does take weaving dozens of chairs before you have it down packed. This is a tricky part. It's something we haven't taught yet. We go straight in. This becomes a unit of three. So this diagonal and these two vertical pairs go under. This is going to do the same thing these do underneath this diagonal. Luckily it's not tied down so I can get it under easily. By coming over this setting I'm covering up this huge chunk of wood. Do we go here? And remember, if you go over it, you should go under it too. It's going to be pretty tight. I might have been very ambitious coming this way with this piece. For this chair, this is the correct hole. Cross over and under every single setting that I can.
it's a good idea to wet your washcloth. Warm water versus cold water makes all the difference. So here we've got two. This can tie into here. This is long enough to use. I'm just going to move it out of the way. This guy we've got here or here we can tie off. These two guys, we don't have much. This guy was really small. That's already got something underneath it. Got no loop there and no loop there. This is a great opportunity to decide that you need to make a loop. These guys need tying off, so I'm making a loop here. You want a medium longish strand. This is pretty long. I'm bending it about the size of the seat plus. These are the tie offs. This is the long end. Here's the loop I created. These are the two ends that didn't have a place to tie off. When I did the loop, I put the short end first and then the long end. So I'll continue. The shorter one I ran here, the longer one I kept going with. Does it go here or does it go here? If you follow the hole to hole mentality, you'll make a mistake. This one should go over here. It has a directional diagonal from number five going under. Every one of these has a diagonal underneath it and on top of it, the strain goes here. Short leg of an X, this is gonna be the long leg of the X. Make sure you wet these every time you go under them. I'll continue making these lovely X's on both sides. When I bring this row down and come in here, it's a short. These guys are shorter than these guys. Long leg of the X, short leg of the X. So just because it's short on one end, it doesn't mean it has to be short on the other. Where this wood shows, that's where you can make X's happen. Once you get down to the corner, that's where it gets tricky. I was able to make X's where the settings were pretty long, and as they got smaller, I'm still able to make X's here, but not down here. The other direction of diagonal will drop right in. I'm going over horizontals in this direction, so I'll go over this one and this one under here. It locks in that pocket. Now I'll go to this pocket, to this pocket, going over horizontals, under verticals. This guy, not here, I would be leaving this pair out. I can easily go over top of it and lock it in that pocket, come under here and drop it in this hole. Over top of here, locking it in that pocket, and creating a nice little X. I do have one more row, it might not look like it. I'm gonna address all those at the same time. I'll weave from here over and come back when I get to this tricky part again, when the settings get small. Corners where two diagonals meet in the same hole are tricky. Two diagonals in the same hole, two diagonals in the same hole, and here we have two diagonals in the same hole. If I went into here, it would be excluding this setting. This setting would only have one piece going under it and nothing going on top of it. Under verticals, over horizontals, under verticals, over horizontals. Two diagonals meet in the same hole. This is that same row where two diagonals met in the corner at the bottom. But in order to come up to the hole next door and work down the chair, I have to skip a row. You're going over two consecutive horizontals. This is just another one of those instances where you have to keep weaving lots of chairs before it makes sense. But it's also another one of those instances where you start to think a little more every time you reach this area where the corners meet the top and bottom and sides of the clock face. 
I have to go under before I can go over. Two diagonals meet in the same hole. Now I can bring this one up next door and see if it will work for weaving the next row. Even though it seems like a stretch, this one has one on top of it, it needs one to go underneath it. This strand will be the last place in the corner. And I'll be making X's at each of these little spaces. Now I have a decision to make. Do I go to this first hole where it's super easy? If I took it one more, I would be crossing over top of this setting, which already has one under it. Check. I should do that. By going under here, I would make an X. And so double check. This is where I go. Went down here came up here. Intentionally manipulate the cane underneath the chair. You want to be very careful never to cover the holes. You have two more strands coming in and out of this hole when we do the binder at step seven. It is tight here. Really have to uh, finagle things. Here or here. We go here, we're skipping this step and this step. So we're going over, under, and into there. This row came down here. If I go hole to hole, then I would be taking this through a very crowded area here. The wood is already covered by this double diagonal. So we skip this hole. Go into here is where I had two strands that needed tying off and everything really close by was hard to get into. So I had to span a hole and tie off here. With that, if I just did this, I'd be blocking the holes. Whenever you skip a hole, place the cane so that you're not blocking it for step seven. You go there, you will be missing an X here. We'll take care of these four corners another time. So close to being done. Four more rows, which is always kind of the joke. We have one row here, one row here. Another strand here will look good. I always try to see what it would look like first. From here, I'm skipping this hole. I did intentionally move this loop underneath to the back. This is a sister chair, it's already woven. Similarly, down here, skip a hole, come up here. So we're going over and under just like before, except that we're including the diagonal. These three strands are now one unit. These three strands are now one unit. These three strands are now one unit. These three these will go under, one, two, three. Over three, under three. Now technically we could go over here and under here and into here. But another thing to think about is that we're gonna be covering up these holes with a binder. So this would be hidden by the binder. It just goes in there. Moving on to the bottom, it's a little trickier. Same principle though, under three, over three, under three, over three. Relatively straight line, but don't expect symmetry on these round chairs. At the front on the other side, you got under a lot less. Same principle, over three, 
under three over three under three just a lot shorter part of the reason is the way the holes were drilled this is a great time to pick up just a random scrap and run it through and see how you would do it it seems pointless to only go over these two but that is completing the pattern Symmetry is hard to achieve. I'm going to start on the binder and I will make another decision after I stare at it longer. What to do and what not to do. When you're weaving the binder of a circular chair, you can have loose loops which means your binder is loose and it can turn on this corner. You can do a peg binder or an overlapping binder. The cane will be coming up and down the hole, so you really do need to make them clear as possible. I like to use a straight awl. You really wanna be intentional in case you have some cane blocking the hole. Measure out enough to go all the way around plus. I've got the four millimeter binder and the size that I wove with, fine, fine. They both soaked in the crock pot for a couple of minutes. If you were to peg the binder in the middle, you would start like this. I like to do an overlapping binder. Start sewing in a few holes over. Bring enough to tie off through and then bring the long end through. So what we're looking for is a nice flat level or slightly dented. This time we start with a tie off. Thankfully this loop is here. I'm just gonna go under one, making sure to not cover that hole. The binder always takes longer than you think it's going to take. A couple of tips, keep the cane kind of flat in the direction you're going. And then once you make the turn, Bring it this way. It wants to flip up. Make sure you don't do that. It's a good idea to keep the seat at eye level. So you see that this is loose. I'm going to tighten underneath. Hold my tension underneath. Pull this side up. And it's tight underneath. Fingers on either side of the loop, it helps keep the binder flat. So tension is still up here, holding here, holding there, pull down. Move to the next loop, tension here, tension underneath, holding here, holding here, holding tension there, pull all the way up, holding the loop underneath. Nice and flat. I'm going to move it this way. Anytime you bend the binder, you want to wet it. I'm going to talk a bit about my hand placement on bottom and top. Notice I'm holding tension below, then I flatten the loop. I still have tension up top as I pull down. I roll my fingers over that bead on top, and then holding tension below, I pull up, flatten the loop, holding tension above, pull down. Holding tension, rolling my finger over the top of that bead, holding tension below as I pull up. Every time I flatten a loop, I think about placing my fingers on either side of the loop and then rolling it over. Fingers on either side, rolling it over. Fingers on either side, rolling it over. On the bottom, I'm just as intentional as the top. You can see that when the loop comes up flush to the bottom of the chair, I take a minute, tug tension and roll it over. Pull the loop out from the top, holding tension, roll it over. From the top, holding tension, roll it over. 
hold tension, untangle your cane, and roll it over. It's been firmly established that the corners are tricky. This is where the binder is going to want to tilt up. You have to be very intentional about making it lay flat. Turning the curve starts earlier than you would think. So start thinking about encouraging the binder this way. Before I tighten the loop, I move the binder over and then tighten the loop. Try to angle it so that this raised part goes down. Smooth it over. You certainly don't want to pull too tight here. We're running low. We should try to plan where we're going to tie off. Make sure the loop on top stayed flush. This was a good spot because I could tie the other one off at this relatively loose loop and tie this one on at this really good loop. Also, I really need to wet this part so it'll be pliable. Bring the sky around. Encourage it to lay flat with your fingers. Always go back to the last loop. Pull flush. I'm always having one hand underneath, holding tension on the loop. And if I'm pulling from the bottom, I'm holding tension on the top. Placing your fingers so that the loop doesn't twist, so that the binder doesn't twist, you have to shape the binder around these deep curves. It is especially important after all of that work, when you take this out, do not bend it back and have it break here. This will be under, this will be on top. This guy wants to bend back and this is classic chair caning. You get so close to being done, you run out of room to finish the rest. This is a really good spot to tie in, although we're perilously close to a spot where it's not great to tie in. If there were not a good place to tie in, I would back this out and tie off somewhere better. So I'll tie this one here, start the new one there. If there are more than one, just go under a couple. Don't try to force it now. I'm holding the tension on the top of this binder loop at all times because you don't want it to back out. And I'm not going to go under both. I'm just going to go under one. It's pretty tight. You want the loop to be straight. And right at the end of this last loop, you cut it. Flush, rotate the loop around so it's gonna catch. Now I'll flip the chair, holding right here, and tie off the remainder. Definitely don't wanna let go of that. Wet the strand, wet the loop, still holding onto the top. Need to tie this off. This space is too loose. This could work. It's also a little loose. This is also a little loose. These are the binder loops. This looks like a good spot. Inconveniently located rail, but you get used to those the more you weave. And one more for good measure. Normally I don't do that on every loop. I like to do it on the end.
There's all these little hairy things that we need to cut them off. You can snip them one by one. Fabulous little beard trimmer works really well to get most of the stuff. A quick run over the top. It does help to get eye level. You'll always find some more. Flip it, do the bottom. Almost seamless binder at the back. Everything is flush, nothing's curling up. I've got nice X's here, short over long. X's, flush binder. This guy's kind of weird, but it's always weird at the corners. Nice X's, weird corners, flush binder. X's up the sides. It takes about a week to weave your first chair. You will break things. You will make mistakes. I made several mistakes during this process. I broke a lot of strands to just keep practicing and know that it will get easier. Thanks for watching the Silver River Chairs channel. Then you should definitely weave it. Do you see there where it's split? <laughs>